Hello, and welcome to Through the Eyes of the Adversary, How to Build a Threat Intel Program. If you're joining us live, our speakers are in the Slido chat discussion, answering your questions right now. For audio video issues, you can click the technical support button below. I'd now like to turn it over to Skart Jarkov and Jason Rivera for the presentation. Awesome, thank you, Casey. So hello everyone, my name is Jason Rivera and I'm the director of the Strategic Threat Advisory Group at CrowdStrike and my colleague Scott Yarkoff actually leads our uh, Asia Pacific region as well and as well as the uh, Europe and Middle East regions uh, most recently as well. So uh, I'm gonna be delivering the presentation today. Scott will be available via Slido to ask any, to answer any questions that you may have. So you know, let's make this nice and interactive because we definitely wanna make sure that this is useful for you all. On that note, let's go ahead and get started. So here's the agenda of what we're going to be reviewing today. There'll be five sections. And you'll notice that we're going to kind of start off at a high level at kind of the conceptual type content where we understand conflict. And then we're going to slowly dive deeper and deeper, you know, kind of throughout. We'll talk about how to perceive threat intelligence through the eyes of the adversary, uh, how to, you know, understand threat intelligence capability areas, how to serve various stakeholders and form the team, as well as examples of how to operationalize threat intelligence. So for this first portion, let's take a look at how we can really understand conflict and explore the reasons why we're doing this in the first place. So when it comes really down to it, you know, the purpose of threat intelligence is to understand the conflicts in which you are engaged. And in general, you'll find that you are engaged in three types of conflicts. There is security conflicts, which is more so about safety and national resources, you know, worrying about other countries invading you or stealing your secrets, you know, things like that. There is uh, economic conflicts, which are mainly financially motivated. So think of like criminals trying to steal your money. Uh, you can also think of it in the form of economic espionage. And then the last type of conflict we have would be ideological conflict. So from a cyber perspective, this would kind of be like the hacktivists or those that are coming after us for ideological type reasons. It could be religious reasons. It could be you know reasons over world events. It could be a variety of different things. But you'll find that in general that these are the three types of conflicts that you will find yourself in. So specifically as it pertains to conflict, you know, we really want to understand the fundamental nature of conflict. And we want to understand how this divides us into two sides. And one way to think of this is it divides us into, you know, ourselves and the adversary. And the reason that it divides us is, you know, when you think about how we are prior to conflict, before conflict, you know, we're all together, we're all united, but then eventually these differences arise. And again, these differences could be security related, they could be economic related, they could be ideological, but fundamentally what happens is that these differences divide us into two separate sides. And that is the reason why we are engaged in the, in the conflict in the first place. So when it comes to threat intelligence, really what you wanna think about here is that we want to leverage threat intelligence to understand this conflict. And that is ultimately our goal, right? The better we understand the conflicts that we're in to include the adversary's capabilities, why they're attacking us in the first place, even how they perceive of our organization, there's lots of different things that we want to understand about that conflict. And our goal of threat intelligence is that once we gain an understanding of these conflicts, and once we truly understand it at the core level, then we can communicate it to our various stakeholders and those stakeholders can take productive actions in order to defend the organization. So again, this is kind of the underlying premise of what we're gonna be going over today. And now we're gonna dive deeper into the various elements of threat intelligence. So, you know, per the title of the brief, uh, what we're really gonna focus on today is how do you really perceive threat intelligence through the eyes of the adversary? And, you know, the goal of understanding anything, whether it be a conflict or an argument or any, any type of, you know, debate that we find ourselves in, the ability to see what the other side sees, the ability to see through the eyes of the adversary and to see through the eyes of the enemy, that's what allows us to really excel and achieve our objectives in terms of the ability to understand conflict. So first, let's, let's imagine that all conflict between ourselves and the adversary can be visualized really as a function of three components. You know, and when we think about, and when I say all conflict, I mean literally all conflict, not just cyber conflict, but any conflict. And those, those elements are mind, body, and actions. And you'll notice that this really applies to any conflict that you're in. And when I say mind, body, and actions, when I, when I mean, what I mean by mind is sort of like the psychological components. So how well prepared are you? And then from a body component, it would be consisting of kind of like the actual body elements. You know, what are my capabilities? What are my weapons? And then actions would be like literally the execution of actions. So let's take a look at how some of these examples apply. So it could be a sports match, right? And let's, let's look at the, some of these examples. 
So for like a sports match, you know, the team with the better strategy would have the mental advantage. The team who's more physically fit would have the body advantage. Whereas the team that executed the better game time execution would be, you know, better in terms of actions. And then if you look at like a fist fight, right? Like let's say we get into a physical fight with each other, you know, from a mon from a mental perspective, we want to think about which fighter is more mentally prepared, which fighter is more physically fit, which fighter threw the better punches. And then lastly, with war, you know, again, the same principles, right? Which army had the better strategy? Which army was better equipped? Which army executed better on the battlefield? And you'll notice that no matter what conflict you are in, you will always see these three elements, mind, body, and actions. So now let's take this principle and let's apply this from a cyber perspective, because obviously, you know, all of us are cybersecurity professionals and we're trying to learn to see how we can really apply this in order to engage in threat intelligence to protect our information technology environment. So once again, let's kind of load up, you know, the two elements, right? You have yourself and the adversary. Those are the two underlying elements. And then we have the three echelons, right? You have mind, body, and actions. But instead, let's use the verbiage strategic, operational, and tactical. And the reason we're going to use the verbiage strategic, operational, and tactical is because this translates better to uh, other security stakeholders. But again, ultimately, the basis of this is the mind, body, and action element. So when we think about the strategic component, what we're concerned about here is why is the adversary going to attack us in the first place? What is it about our industry? What is it about our assets that you know makes, uh, makes us an attractive target? For what reason might they have the motive to come after us? Are they security motives, economic motives, ideological motives? And then we want to explore things like their intent. You know, Do they want to extort us? Do they want to steal from us, commit espionage against us, or engage in destructive attacks? And then the level below this, is we want to understand what the adversary is going to target in our organization. And probably the best way to think of your body or the operational component is people, processes, and technologies. All organizations are comprised of these three things. And then when we think about this from the adversary side, we want to understand their capabilities and their infrastructure. In terms of capabilities, we're concerned about the type of malware they might leverage or distributed denial of service attacks, social engineering. So we want to know the malware they'll leverage against our technologies or the social engineering, the leverage against our people. And then from an infrastructure perspective, we want to know where these capabilities are going to come from. So from which IP addresses or from which locations, which domains. And then lastly, we want to understand how the adversary is going to get into our organization. We want to understand the tactical level or the actions that they will take to gain access to us. And in general, you can think of your organization across three access vectors, the digital, physical, and psychological access vectors. Digital being things like uh, you know exploiting systems or applications. Physical being physical attacks like USBs and you know supply chain compromise. And psychological being things like social engineering or coercive attacks such as bribery and threats and things like that. And then of course we want to think about the tactics, techniques, and procedures or TTPs that they're going to leverage in order to gain access to us. So again, ultimately our goal is to understand what industry am I in and what what are my business critical assets. What adversaries are motivated to target my industry and how might they do so? How will the adversary exploit my people, processes, and technologies? What capabilities will the adversary use against me? And what infrastructure will these capabilities come from? And then how will the adversary gain access to my organization across the digital, physical, and psychological access vectors, as well as what tactics, techniques, and procedures will the adversary leverage to gain access to my organization? So again, the goal of intelligence is we want to understand these things. The deeper our understanding of these things and the better our ability to articulate that understanding to other stakeholders, the better our ability to perform threat intelligence. And again, something I want to emphasize is if you have any questions, you know, please you know, chat with Scott via Slido, because I know that some of this content can be complicated. So we definitely want to make sure that we answer any questions that you might have. So let's dive a little bit deeper and let's dissect this to kind of another level, right? So again, we have the adversary side, we have the strategic, operational, and tactical components, as well as motive, intent, capability, infrastructure, and TTPs. And again, we want to really focus on these elements because we, this, these are truly the core elements of our adversary. And our ability to understand these will help us really kind of defend our organization. So here are some examples of, what you have, of how you might see this kind of manifest into real life. You know, from a motive perspective, you know, we discussed that there are ideological, economic, and security motives. From an intent perspective, you know, we're looking out for things like extortion, destructive attacks, espionage attacks, and all sorts of other attacks that the adversary might want to leverage against us. 
from a capability standpoint, examples might include, you know, malware, DDoS, social engineering, and obviously the various subcategories such as ransomware and data stealers and, you know, Trojans and other things to that effect. From an infrastructure standpoint, we want to understand things like, you know, bot, what, what botnets might they use? What about their command and control infrastructure? How are they going to send spam? Or what about their hostile IP addresses and proxies or malware as a service? Again, we want to understand the infrastructure because that's where the capabilities are going to come from. And then lastly, you know, we will also want to understand kind of the TTPs they might leverage against us, such as physical device compromise or supply chain compromise, phishing, lateral movement, so on and so forth. And again, the more the better your ability to really specifically understand these things, the better your ability to, you know, again, defend your organization and be really predictive with your threat intelligence program. This next portion we're going to talk about are threat intelligence capability areas. So once again, let's kind of think about this at the more abstract level and let's think about where conflict occurs. In general, conflict can occur in one of three spaces. There's your space, which is you. There's the adversary space. And then there's everything else in between, which would be considered contested space. And let's look at some various examples of how this might apply. Like once again, you know, we have three different examples. Let's use sports, chess, and war. And in terms of how these apply, from a sports perspective, you know, you have your goal, the adversary's goal, and then the field is contested space. From a chess perspective, you have your king, the adversary's king, and then this, the chessboard itself and all the pieces would be the contested space. And then lastly, from a war perspective, you have your country, the adversary's country, and then again, all the territory in between. And you'll notice that these principles are universal. No matter what type of conflict you are in, you will notice that you'll see always these three spaces, that, that you'll always see these apply. So once again, let's put our cyber lens on and really take a look at how this applies to us. So you know, for, from, the, from this perspective, we have our IT environment, the internet, and then the adversary's environment. And within that, now you have, within these operational spaces, you have threat intelligence, you have associated threat intelligence capability areas. And these capability areas include intelligence enrichment, threat monitoring, and threat intelligence reporting. And now let's talk about what these different intelligence disciplines are and how they can benefit our organization. So let's take a look at how we can really conduct intelligence amongst these three areas. So from an intelligence enrichment perspective, this is about consuming indicators of attack and compromise, as well as signature-based uh, defenses as well. And our goal here is to empower or enrich defensive alerting and blocking systems. Examples of disciplines under this uh, particular form of threat intelligence might be IOC ingestion, sensor tuning, or malware analysis. From a threat monitoring perspective, again, we want to monitor the internet and we want to look for things like leaked credentials, PII, brand infringement, malware, malicious mentions, so on and so forth. And for this area, we want to cover the various aspects of the internet to include the surface web, social media, deep and dark web, and digital footprint. And then we also want to consume intelligence reporting on adversarial motive, intent, capabilities, infrastructure, and TTPs, because the better our ability to understand these things, the more we can get inside their mindset. And again, remember, if we can see things from their point of view, that allows us to truly be predictive in the way that we uh, you know, prevent these attacks. And for reporting, I, always use, I use a model called the what, so what, what next model. And in my experience as an intelligence professional, these three elements are what make a good report. You know, the what piece is, well, what is happening? Tell me about the information. Tell me, you know, what's going on. The so what is the implications. Why should you care about this? Why is this important to me? And lastly, the what next is what do we actually do about this? How do we take action? What are the defensive measures that we need to put into motion? So again, these are the three elements of threat intelligence. And any good intelligence program will consider everything, will consider a variety of factors across these three elements and then create a program that is appropriately mixed amongst these three different areas. So next thing I want to go over are some common best practices and myths. So again, let's look at these three threat intelligence areas and let's look at some best practices. So for intelligence enrichment, we want to engage in high degrees of automation. We want to ingest timely content. The closer we can get to now, the better. We want to ingest content derived from attack telemetry. From a threat monitoring standpoint, we want to have well-crafted keywords. We want to know where to look for the, the right threats. And we also want to really have expectation management and realize that not, we're not going to get everything out of this source. 
And then from a threat reporting standpoint, we want to have the bottom line up front. We want to know exactly why we need to read this report and exactly what the so what is. And we want reporting that is actionable as well as focused on implications. In terms of some common myths, here's a lot of what I see in the industry. A lot of organizations think that more indicators are better when in fact, no, it is not. You, if you can ingest so much and if, if you ingest too much, it could cause false positives. It could cause a false sense of security. So you definitely want to avoid that. Also, there's this notion that sometimes all intelligence can be automated, that everything is about in indicators. And, you know, that's just not true, right? Intelligence is a very broad discipline. Yes, some of it can be automated, and we definitely want to maximize our automation, but we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket, and we definitely want to pay attention to the other elements of intelligence as well. From a threat monitoring standpoint, some common things I hear is that, you know, one is just a, a very a fixation on the dark web. And uh, I will tell you now, the dark web does not contain all the answers in the world. Yes, it contains a certain subset of the answers. But again, the problem is much broader than the dark web. So we don't just want to fixate only on the dark web. And also there's this notion that you're going to go on the dark web and find chatter. And here's what I kind of have to say to that. Uh, Smart actors aren't going to, quote unquote, chatter on the dark web. The smart ones are just going to attack you. And think of it logically, like why would an actor announce their intent? So I, that's something I hear a lot about chatter. And that's uh, honestly, I just want to kind of debunk that one. You're not going to find too much chatter on the dark web. And then lastly, with intelligence reporting, you know, a lot of organizations, they think they should only care about their sector or their geography. And my logic back to that is, does malware care about your sector or geography? No. Malware doesn't care what sector you're in, nor does it care what geography you're in. And especially from a criminal adversary standpoint, they're looking for opportunities. So whatever's happening in your sector or geography, yes, that's relevant, but you also want to expand your horizons. And you want to realize also for the, you know, going to the second point, that not all the answers are going to be fed to you on a silver platter. You know, it really consuming threat reporting can be challenging. You have to engage in critical thinking and it really can be a tough process. So now let's look at some of the stakeholders that we need to serve and talk about how we should form a team based off these stakeholders. So in general, you'll find that there are three different types of stakeholders. There are the strategic, operational, and tactical. And what you'll notice is that each stakeholder is of a particular type. So the strategic ones are like the leaders and decision makers, you know, the CISO, the CIO, CTO, so on and so forth. And the operational members are kind of like you and I, you know, members of the SOC. They're threat hunters, vulnerability management people, incident responders, basically everybody that works in a SOC. Whereas your tactical stakeholders are defensive systems, such as SIMS, firewall, antivirus, IDS, IPS, EDR, so on and so forth. And then you'll notice that each stakeholder has particular needs. So for example, the strategic stakeholders are focused on leveraging intelligence to make better decisions. Whereas the operational stakeholders are focused on using intelligence to be better at their job functions. So the SOC analyst wants to make better use cases, the threat hunters want to know what to threat hunt for. The vulnerability management professional wants to know how to prioritize their vulnerabilities, so so on and so forth. And then with your defensive systems stakeholders or your tactical stakeholders, they want to leverage intelligence to achieve faster, more efficient, and more comprehensive system alerting and blocking. And again, you really want to focus on your stakeholders, right? Because that is the purpose of intelligence. We want to understand the conflicts we're in, but if we if if all we can do is understand it, but we don't have the ability to communicate the intelligence, then, all, then everything that we do is meaningless. So we definitely want to focus on our stakeholders and make sure that our activities and our actions are serving their interests. So moving on, you also want to design a team that is really designed to serve these stakeholders and really go after their interests. So once again, you have the strategic, operational, and tactical stakeholders. And I would honestly propose that you create your team to be focused around these stakeholders. So for instance, having strategic analysts, which are good at, you know, good at speaking, good at presenting, good at simplifying really technical content for non-technical audiences. And then you have operational analysts who they understand what it's like to be in a SOC. They understand kind of vulnerability management. They get incident response. They understand threat hunting. And they don't have to be experts in all of it, but they understand what a day in the life looks like. And their ability to understand that allows them to translate the intelligence into useful content for them. And then you have tactical analysts, which have a really good understanding of malware functionality at the binary level, as well as the ability to granularly communicate adversary TTPs and capabilities. 
And again, here's some of the activities that you want to see them engage in. You want your strategic analysts to really brief in these stakeholders and receiving feedback and drive in the direction of the program. You want your operational analysts to make the SOC better, help respond to incidents, help manage vulnerabilities, so on and so forth. And then you want your tactical analysts to reverse engineer malware, help with ingestion automation, really make everything function more smoothly, as well as empower the rest of the organization's understanding of TTPs and malware. Now let's look at let's look, let's take a look at some of this some of these examples in, in in action and see how we can actually operationalize this in our own in our own environments. So for this first scenario, we're going to take a look at a financially motivated e-crime actor seeking to conduct a ransomware attack. And then as you can see, what you have over here is our little mapping of ourselves and the adversary and the different echelons of the conflict to include strategic, operational, and tactical. So first off, you know, let's take uh, what, what industries does ransomware uh, affect? That's all of us, right? Ransomware does not discriminate. So this would be an all industry type threat. And the assets they're going after are our financial assets. From a motive perspective, you have a financially motivated e-crime actor. From an intent perspective, we're focused on extortion, which is what ransomware is. We want to focus on domain admins. And the reason we want to focus on the domain admins is because the adversary is going to exploit your domain admins. And the reason for that, they want to get to your domain controller so they can universally deploy the ransomware throughout the environment. From a capability standpoint, we want to focus on banking trojans because typically banking trojans are the precursors to ransomware. They leverage the banking trojans to perform reconnaissance to better understand the environment and then to call down the ransomware once they gain access to the domain controller. And then of course, we want to understand the ransomware itself. And then from an infrastructure perspective, we want to understand the adversary's hostile IP space, their VPNs, as well as their proxies. We want to understand how they're going to engage in phishing in order to get malware into our environment. And then we also want to understand you know, how our operating systems might be vulnerable. So now let's see how intelligence can help us better understand this threat. So I'm going to go ahead and load up the slide, and then I'll talk over each of the various pieces. So from an Intel enrichment standpoint, you want to consume indicators of the most current banking Trojan families associated with ransomware. You also want to consume YAR and snort rules in order to block custom compiled ransomware, because a lot of ransomware these days is custom compiled. From a threat monitoring standpoint, you want to conduct web scraping against potential credential leaks that could be used to achieve remote logins, as well as monitor for malicious traffic. From a threat reporting standpoint, you want to really engage that reporting on all these major ransomware operators, and you want to consume the threat actor profiles of those actors that have the most powerful and most effective ransomware attacks. From a tactical stakeholders perspective, you know, we want to focus on how we can ingest this stuff into the SIM and our antivirus solutions, as well as our EDR solutions. Remember, because that's the purpose for Intel enrichment. From an operational stakeholder standpoint, we want to give this data to threat hunters. We want to make sure our threat hunters have the most current YAR rules and sort rules so they can hunt within the environment. And then we want to make sure that we're giving the vulnerabilities that are exploited by these actors to the vulnerability management team. And the way we might find out about these vulnerabilities is through the reporting. And then from a strategic stakeholder standpoint, what we want to do here is we want to help inform the CISO about how to better inform his or her organization from, uh, and better defend their organization from attacks by helping them make better spending decisions, better organizational decisions. And then we may want to inform the CTO about, hey, here's a risk to our environment. Based off this risk, we may want to change the way the environment is structured. We may want to buy these new technologies, so on and so forth. For our second example, we're going to review a nation state actor with intent to conduct espionage against a pharmaceutical company. So in this example, our industry is healthcare. Our assets are intellectual property. The motive might be something along the lines to enhance the national healthcare capacity. From an intent perspective, we're focused on espionage. From a people perspective, we want to focus on the scientists that they might exploit. And then from a process perspective, we want to look at how are they conducting classified or sensitive communications. We also want to be on the lookout for the data servers, because that's where the because you know, the data servers are where the intellectual property is stored. And we also want to think about the capabilities that the adversary is going to use. 
And those capabilities might include remote access tools, as well as data stealers. From an infrastructure standpoint, we want to be aware of the adversary's human intelligence infrastructure, because oftentimes, especially with these high profile intellectual property targets, the adversary might actually use people to perform the attack. And we also want to be aware of the adversary's command and control servers to see where they're performing the attacks from and where they try to exfiltrate the data to. From a tactical perspective, now we want to look at how the adversary is going to get in. So when you think about how a lot of these intellectual property attacks have been done in the past, we want to worry about things like USB thumb drives or bribery across the psychological access vector, and then potentially even lateral movement from a trusted third party. So again, a lot of these things are just examples to get you thinking, but now you guys are kind of getting the idea, right? So let's see how intelligence can help us better understand this threat. Oops, sorry, I'm experiencing a slight lag here. Let me see if I can get the previous slide up again. All right, let's look at how the different intelligence capability areas can help solve the previous uh, scenario too. So from an intelligence enrichment standpoint, we want to consume indicators of the most current remote access tools and associated downloaders. We also, doing, we also want to engage in automated sandbox analysis of malware associated with those nation state actors that might want to steal our intellectual property. From a threat monitoring standpoint, we want to conduct web scraping in search of intellectual property leaks and or evidence of insider threats. We also want to scrape for malicious malware that could potentially be used to steal data. From a threat reporting standpoint, we want to consume reporting on actors that are known to steal intellectual property so we can familiarize ourselves with their TTPs and prepare against them. And then obviously we know that it's very common for China to try to steal intellectual property. So we want to focus on actors like, you know, threat actors in nations like China and other nations and threat actors that are known to steal intellectual property so we can gain familiarity with their methodologies. From, from a tactical stakeholder perspective, you want to use things like the sandbox, antivirus, and EDR. From an operational stakeholder's perspective, you know, obviously, you know, the insider threat teams here is are, are very relevant, as well as vulnerability management team. And then from a strategic stakeholder perspective, we want to focus on physical security, you know, things like USB drives and how do they get in there in the first place, as well as some of those human intelligence operations where they may be trying to bribe or threaten people to get their way. And then obviously the CTO as well, because he has a large purview over technology within the environment. So to summarize, uh, and again, Scott is, Scott is also here to answer questions in Slido as well. So I hope you've been answer, asking some good questions to him. But if you have any more questions, you know, feel free to ask him uh, now as well. Uh, but to summarize here, here's basically what we've talked about. We've talked about a few things, right? So we're acknowledging that we are in conflict. There's us and the adversary. And for whatever reason, there is just something that we disagree about. It could be security related. It could be economic. It could be ideological. There's a variety of reasons that we find ourselves in conflict. The first thing we want to do when we're in this conflict is we immediately want to take the view of the adversary. We want to understand why they're going to attack us in the first place. What about us makes, attractive, makes us attractive targets? What types of capabilities and infrastructure might they use against our people, processes, and technologies? And which sort of tactics, techniques, and procedures, or TTPs, might they use to gain access to our organization? Once we think we have an understanding of the situation, we want to start collecting intelligence across the three intelligence capability areas to include intelligence enrichment, which empowers our own environment with indicators and other atomic content, uh, threat monitoring, which helps us better understand threats from the internet, and then threat reporting, which helps us understand the adversary's motive, intent, capability, infrastructure, and TTPs. Lastly, we want to serve intelligence stakeholders. Remember that every single thing that we do, every piece of intelligence we produce, the purpose of it is to serve the stakeholders. We have strategic stakeholders, which are decision makers at a higher level, operational stakeholders, which are basically members of the SOC, and then the tactical stakeholders, which are our defensive systems. So again, all of this here, what I'm showing you, this is designed to help us better prepare against adversaries. And ultimately, again, kind of like the title of this, of this deck and this presentation, we want to be able to view the problem through their eyes. The better our ability to view the problem through their eyes, the better our ability to engage in intelligence operations. So thank you for attending. And at this time, I'll, uh, myself and Scott will take any questions that you guys might have.